As we turn our attention to uh, the reading, uh, the preaching, and the hearing of God's Word, sometimes the most uh, spiritual and the most godly thing or deed a person can do is the most practical one. Sometimes the most spiritual thing that Christians can do are the most practical ones. Uh, While our faith is full of wonderful and glorious uh, doctrines which we cherish to grasp, to understand, to apply... Our Christian faith is also truly practical. And as we look now and continue in Paul's letter to the church in Thessalonica, 1 Thessalonians 4, Paul turns to a very practical matter. And that is how a Christian is conducting their own life and how they are conducting their life in relation to others, specifically brothers and sisters in the body of Christ. So it's 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, just four verses, 9 through 12. Listen now to God's word. Paul continues, and he writes, Now concerning brotherly love, you have no need for anyone to write to you, for you yourselves have been taught by God to love one another. For that indeed is what you are doing to all the brothers throughout Macedonia. But we urge you, brothers, to do this more and more, and to aspire to live quietly, and to mind your own affairs, and to work with your hands as we instructed you, so that you may walk properly before outsiders and be dependent on no one. Well, for the first time in this letter, uh, Paul raises a concern Uh, a kind of caution to these believers. We have seen Paul already express tremendous thanks, as he does in a number of his letters, for these believers, for their work of faith in chapter 1, their labor of love, and their steadfastness of hope. And then into chapter 2, he continued expressing thanks by how the word of God was received by them and at work in their lives. But now he turns to a particular concern or caution. And it's a concern that really centers on two things, as I said at the outset. Two threads that kind of are woven through, threaded through these four verses. The first is one's particular individual conduct as a Christian. And the second is how they are related to one another. We could say one is personal conduct, the other is relational conduct. Both of these points are illustrated very well in C.S. Lewis's work, Mere Christianity, in his chapter in that work, in that book, on moral behavior, on Christian behavior. And here's what Lewis says. There are two ways in which the human machine goes wrong. One is when human individuals drift apart from one another, or else collide with one another and do one another damage by cheating or bullying, he says. The other is when things go wrong inside the individual, when the different parts of him drift apart or collide within himself. He says, you can get the idea plainly if you think of us as a fleet of ships sailing in formation. The voyage will be a success only in the first place if each ship is seaworthy and has her engines in good order And secondly, if the ships do not collide and get in one another's way. If the ships keep on having collisions, they will not remain seaworthy very long. What Paul is teaching in these four verses and what Lewis illustrates here is in one way a very simple thing. We all know how we conduct ourselves as individual believers is important. It reflects Uh, our faith, the sincerity and legitimacy of our Christian testimony, how we conduct ourselves as believers. We also know how important it is, uh, our relationship to one another, how we relate to each other. That, too, reflects our faith and Christian testimony. But before we unpack further Paul's concerns, his sort of practical precepts in verses 9 through 11 on how they should be relating to each other, I want us to see first the reason that Paul gives as to why 
we should be relating to one another in particular ways. And that comes in verse 12, the last verse that I read. The reason is stated very clearly in verse 12. He says this, So that you may walk properly before outsiders and be dependent on no one. Those words, so that, are a purpose clause. He is saying, live in this way toward outsiders, or live in this way, rather, toward one another, so that, or for this reason, and one of the main reasons he mentions has very little to do or less to do with the church itself and a lot more to do with those outside the church. What kind of reputation the body of Christ has to the world or before the world. That word outsiders in verse 12 is referring to non-believers, those outside of Christ, those who do not know the Lord. Notice what Paul does not say as to the reason. He doesn't say, love one another, aspire to live quietly, to mind your own affairs, so that you would show respect to one another. Well, respect is a good and a godly thing, but that's not the reason that Paul gives in how we are to relate to, to one another here. He also does not say, love one another, mind your own affairs, live peaceably, so that you will bring glory to God. Well, we should do all things under the glory of God, but that's not the reason that Paul centers on here. His reason centers very much on the mission of God to the world. It's the church's effect in the world as a result of her reputation that you may walk properly before outsiders. There's at least two profound points that Paul makes or implies in these words. One, and they're very profound, one is that the church, life in the corporate community is ordained by God. It is prescribed by God as a vital means to influence and bear witness to the world. And what Paul is teaching rests upon, we might say, even a greater foundation from what Jesus has taught. We heard it read earlier in John chapter 13. A new commandment I give you, love one another as I have loved you. And then Jesus goes on and tells his disciples the effect that this is going to have. He says, by this, that is love, a Christ-like love, all people will know that you are my disciples. So how God's people relate to one another, namely through a sacrificial love, a Christ-like love for one another, by this will the world know we are Christ followers. It's profound because it tells us that missional, evangelistic, world impact is not only the result of people being sent out into the world, but how the church relates to itself, to one another, how we speak to one another, think of one another, feel for one another as the community of faith. There's a couple different ways to diminish or undercut the influence and reputation of Christ's church before a watching world. One is to present to the world a faulty gospel a gospel that has been corrupted or distorted. That was part of the challenge that Paul dealt with in the church in Corinth and the churches in Galatia. The church in Corinth with their false view that God's grace gave them a license to sin. They were misunderstanding the gospel. Or the churches in Galatia, they were tempted to believe that the grace of God is obtained by obedience to God's law, rather than by grace through faith. So to present or to represent such a false gospel is to hinder the church's reputation, to be ineffective as a result in the world. So it's corrupting the very substance of God's truth. Uh, this has probably happened at one time or another uh, to all of us. You've gone out to dinner with your family or your friends. You've sat down. You're, you've ordered your meal and you're looking forward to that wonderful plate of 
pasta, lasagna, spaghetti, steak, twice baked potatoes, not all that together, but whatever your choice is. Finally, the server brings you the meal and you take that first bite and it's wonderful. It's fulfilling. You go down for a second bite and the, not only the noodles come up, but something else comes up with it. It's a hair. Has this ever happened to anybody? A few. Okay, some of, many of you are lucky. Okay. Now that food that had tasted so good is not tasting good anymore. That food that once looked so good is not looking so good anymore. And that can happen when one misunderstands or distorts the truth of the gospel. It's part of what happened in the church in Corinth and the churches in Galatia. But that is not Paul's concern for the church in Thessalonica. As we've seen, they had, ex they had received the gospel. Uh, Paul, Silas, Timothy, they have expressed tremendous encouragement in how the word is taking effect and producing fruit in these believers' lives. So Paul's concern or caution is not in their understanding of the substance of the gospel. His concern is in how their reputation as a communal people might affect the world's view of this gospel. In this way, re-entering into that restaurant, it's not the food itself that becomes the concern. It's the plate or it's the hands that serve it. No one wants to eat food, however good it might be, from hands that are grimy or dirty or unwashed. Which is why daily and weekly we return to the Lord that he would renew and wash us again. It, it's what we heard last week from Psalm 51. Cleanse me, O Lord. Renew me. Wash me again that I might have a clear conscience before you. So profound point number one from Paul is that communal life is ordained as a vital means to bearing witness. Our reputation as the people of God is vital to our mission, success in the world for the Lord Jesus Christ. Profound point number two from Paul is that the believer depends upon the church community to carry out a central command that Christ has given to us, namely to love one another. Which is why a, a churchless Christianity is an oxymoron. It does not exist. I need you and we need one another in order for us to fulfill this central command that Jesus has given to love in a way that he has loved. You see, God in his infinite wisdom has ordained and designed an environment, the church, very much like marriage, the marriage relationship, in order to shape a people who would have Christ-like love. Think of marriage in Ephesians chapter 5. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. Wives, submit to your husbands as to the Lord. At the heart of marriage is a husband and wife called to live out the gospel by dying to self in order to bless the other. And unless you are the exception, that is likely not realized when one first enters marriage. In my experience, and I was a Christian entering into marriage, in my observation and counseling with others, prior to them getting, to, getting married? How many of you entered marriage thinking to yourself, I want to enter marriage in order to learn to die to myself? I would be surprised. And yet that is central to God's design for marriage. To sanctify the people of God. Most marriages go through stages. Stage one, romance, attraction. Stage two, reality. Maybe even disillusionment. This person isn't perfect, and they're learning that I am not perfect. Stage three, reorientation. 
adjustment, navigation. What should it look like for imperfect, sinful people to live in close proximity to each other? Very close proximity. Stage four, commitment. Commitment. And we return through those again and again. We certainly can. Life in the family of God is very similar. He he does not call his people into his family so that we would have it easy or so that we would be comfortable. He calls us to know an ever-growing Christ-like commitment to him and his people. A commitment that's demonstrated through sacrificial love. The Thessalonians were demonstrating this. He says in verse 9, Now concerning brotherly love, he is returning to this theme which he had addressed at the very beginning of the letter about their labor of love. Now concerning brotherly love, you have no need for anyone to write to you. You have been taught by God to love one another just as you were doing to all the brothers throughout Macedonia. Quite amazing the reputation that has spread from this church. It had spread throughout Macedonia, which would include places like Philippi, and Berea. Additionally, when Paul writes his second letter, or 2 Corinthians chapters 8 and 9, about that collection uh, for the saints in Jerusalem who were in need, he mentions the graciousness among, among the believers of Macedonia, which would have included the Thessalonians. But while Paul urges them to express this love, as he says in verse 10 of our text, more and more... He gives them some practical wisdom about how this love should take shape. Because there's two dangers when it comes to love. One is to not show it. To simply not seek for opportunities to love and to bless the other. But the other danger is to express too much love in the wrong way. Now, that may sound a bit strange, but I think that's very much what Paul is cautioning about in these verses, particularly verse 11. So, in addition to urging more and more love, he gives practical shape to this love. He mentions a few things in verse 11. This is the practical aspect that Paul is getting at here, relationally. Aspire to live quietly or some translations say, live peaceably, to mind your own affairs, and to work with your hands. That is, not to be busy bodies, as he'll say in the second letter that he writes to them, but busy doing the work of God. But I want to focus in on those first two. To live quietly and to mind your own affairs. They're really two sides of the same coin. Those words, to live quietly or to live peaceably, I think are a bit tricky. He uses similar words when he wrote to the younger pastor Timothy in 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 2, when he's calling believers to pray for the civil authorities so that they may live their faith undisturbed or quietly. But that's not the use of Paul's words here. It's not in relation to the culture or state that Paul's talking about. Living quietly here is not about living passively or not speaking or being restful. It really is this. It's not intruding into the lives of other people, especially brothers and sisters in Christ, so as to become a burden to them. So it's intrusion in unwise and unhelpful ways that takes wisdom. Have you ever felt like your own space was intruded or invaded? How many of us have ever had our vehicles and or our homes invaded, broken into? A good number of us. I've had both. I've been to the country of France uh, one time in the early 2000s. While I was there, one of the places that I wanted to see was the, the final avenue, the final stretch 
1.2 mile stretch of road, beautiful, uh, that ends the cycling race, the Tour de France, every summer. Uh, it's the Avenue uh, de Chancelier. Is that? Some of you know French. If you're like me and you don't know French, you can just say uh, the Champs LSEs is what we have. And then it ends with uh, these beautiful pillars at the very end of the race. Well, to get to, to the avenue, it meant me taking the Paris subway. And I remember getting on the subway packed in there like sardines. And as a good tourist, I had my fanny pack on the front and inside a good and large camera. And as the subway began, I had my hands on two poles up above, jammed and packed in there. And after about two or three minutes, I glanced down and the fanny pack had been unzipped and there was a hand on my camera. And it was not my own hand. It was the hand of a young girl. And I looked at her and said, what are you doing? And she took her hand out and there was not much I could do. I don't know French. I was in a foreign country and we're packed in a public place. Uh, maybe you've had similar experiences, but when Paul says, live quietly, don't intrude, he's not warning against thievery. He's giving wisdom about not intruding into the lives of one another or meddling in their affairs. The two sides of the coin, live quietly, don't intrude into the other's affairs, and mind your own. Now, at first glance, that might seem like a contradiction because there are several places in Scripture where we are called to engage, at times even intervene, in one another's lives. Paul says in Philippians chapter 2, verse 4, look not only to your own interests, but to the interests of others. In Galatians chapter 6, Paul says, Brothers, if anyone is caught up in a transgression, you who are spiritual, go. Go and restore the brother. But that apparent contradiction is easily resolved. Paul's not ruling out a wholesome engagement and a care for others, but in meddling in others' affairs. And here's the crucial reason why this is so important. I'll put it this way. The reason Paul says, don't meddle in the affairs and business of others is because we, as the church of Christ, have a much greater business to attend to. We have a much greater vision that Christ our Lord has given to us that should consume us. Bear, to bear witness to a desperate world. To bear fruit as God's people. To embrace one another with brotherly love. There's a fellow PCA pastor uh, out in near Seattle that I've come to know and respect greatly. And I want to read just an excerpt from a recent email or article that he sent out to his church because it captures very well in one application and one uh, practical way uh, what resonates with my heart. And he's speaking in the context of what we have been through in this country and world in the pandemic, among other things. So he says this. Here's the practical outcome. When our hearts are filled with this larger transcendent mission of bearing fruit in Christ, everything else, even death, takes an appropriately smaller role. This is why Jesus, when pressed on the abomination of paying taxes to the brutal imperialists in Rome, could say, in effect, whatever. That whole bit of show me a coin with the image of Caesar on it was to say, this coin bears Caesar's image, but you bear the image of God. Be about his business. Don't get sidetracked by trivia like taxes or masks or vaccinations. Your heart belongs to more important things. He goes on. My point is not that you have to get vaccinated or not, but that you should make your decision and move on. Learn to see your life in terms of the purpose of your existence. When you meet God face to face, 
He will not ask you if you gained power over those who were trying to control you. He will not ask you if you successfully defended your rights. He will not ask you if they took your property, your livelihood, your family, or your life. Many, many saints before us have lost all those things. All that will matter is whether in all things you were a good and faithful servant and gave him a return on his profound investment in you, Matthew 25. Is that really what you're about? Let's get after the things that matter, end quote. There are many, many things that are important to us as Christians and to the Church of Christ. Many things. The lives and the well-being of one another. The role of civil government in society as instituted by Christ himself. Uh, The way that children and young people are educated. The list could go on. And while these may be significant issues, believers may vary in their perspective and view. So that it is only when the larger vision and mission of Christ fills the heart of the church that all other issues, while significant and worth passion, may take their appropriate place. We have the greatest, the most important mission that Christ has given to make known his greatness and his grace through the gospel, to demonstrate the love of Christ through loving sacrifice, by encouraging and helping one another and bearing the fruit of the Spirit and kingdom showing mercy to those in suffering and need. Here we are in a world divided over many things, but the church has the great calling of demonstrating oneness by giving herself to that glorious mission, by allowing that central calling to so consume the lens of our hearts that everything else takes a second place. He is to be first. His mission is to be first. Let's pray together. Oh Lord, how we thank you that you not only reveal in your word great and glorious truths, but then you give us shape to those truths, applying them to our lives, and giving us your spirit to live in wisdom and in love. Lord, how we thank you for uh, the body of Christ, into which you have engrafted us, saved us, adopted us, And Lord, how we thank you for this body of believers. You have been faithful to us. We desire to be faithful to you. And we pray, O Lord, that you would continue to give us grace one to another, uh, to have wisdom to apply your command of love, that we might consider the other before ourselves always. We pray, Lord, that you would humble us, each and every one of us. Indeed, humble me. And I pray that you would pour out your blessings, that we would know um, your favor, that we would know your power at work within us. Uh, May your Holy Spirit uh, blow as the wind through our hearts, through uh, we as your people, uh, so that we would be a light uh, in a dark world. Uh, For we praise you for your son, Jesus, who is the light of the world. Continue to feed us not only from your word, but, Lord, in this meal that we partake as your people. For this we pray with thanks in Jesus' name. Amen.